Amen. We're here to talk about missions. And what too often happens is with missionaries, they tell me today, is that we come in and then we don't talk about missions. We talk about other things. And I think maybe it's undue pressure upon the missionary, but have y'all ever heard the stories about preacher's kids? See, they see, I mean, it's, it's... So missionaries are aware of that, and I think that a lot of times they're trying to do anything to keep from losing their kids. And so when, like even my big boys, because they're not going to the mission field with us, they don't often travel with us. And we were not too far from home, and they went with me to hear me preach in the evening, and I, I asked them if they were coming back in, excuse me, in the morning. I asked them if they were coming back in the evening, and they said, well, it's a different place. Are you going to preach that same sermon? You know? And so <clears throat> you, you kind of feel pressured because, I mean, you can laugh about PKs. And my daddy always told people preacher's kids were so bad because they had to play with the deacon's kids, all right? <laughs> <clears throat> but missionaries feel that pressure. I mean, I just recently heard a fella that, that I believe knows what he's talking about. And he said he, saw, he knew of no fewer than... than 15 pastor's kids that were in homosexuality. Now that's a hot button issue today, right? But then he went ahead and said, now if we go ahead and count the ones that are in fornication, we'd be overwhelmed with how many people are in sin. So missionaries, maybe we're under the pressure to preach the whole counsel of God because we don't want our kids to just hear uh, these sermons about missions, but... Missions is what we're here to talk about today, so that's what I'm going to do my best to do. Uh, in Psalm 33, 12, if, if you don't know a lot of scripture around here, you can just get it off the wall, amen? But <clears throat> blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, right? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that, that was true. I, I won't preach the, I got a sermon I call the home field advantage. I won't preach the home field advantage sermon to you today, but for a long time, Christianity had what, me, what might be called a home field advantage here in these United States. <clears throat> but I want to talk about where we are. Let's read Acts 1-8, and then we're going to get in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, he said when you were going to get out, and so because he told you when you're going to get out, I'm going to re rely heavily upon my notes so I don't rabbit trail too much, all right? <laughs> Acts 1-8, <clears throat> but ye shall receive power... After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. If you are given to writing in your Bible, I want you to circle that word, both. Both. Now, if you don't write in your Bible, some people find that to be irreverent. I'm going to leave that between you and the Lord. But I want to emphasize the word, both. We are... Well, let's just start with my notes. I said I was going to rely heavily upon them. I told you in Sunday school about me doing the uh, survey with about 30 kids, all of whom were associated with one local church or another. All of those churches would have been considered pretty conservative, though they weren't all independent Baptists. All these kids considered themselves devout or faithful in their walk with Christ. And one kid, Brother Bill, when he finished the survey, he cursed out loud. He said, what the, do they mean 27% Christian? I said, I think your answer shows us, son. <clears throat> but we talked about it. They said, uh, again, I told you, these are not hard questions. They were, what is marriage? Are the Quran and the Bible equal? Are Jehovah and Jesus the same? 50% of them said that Islam and Christianity were equal. 60% of them said communism was the right path. 70% had some humanistic tendency, which is man and not God is the measure, okay? Uh, that's the mentality that we created a God to suit our needs, okay? 80% were new age. Uh, and again, these, these kids consider themselves Christians now, but the way they answer these questions, all roads lead to heaven. That's what new age is for the most part. And 90% said there is no absolute truth. There is no absolute truth. Now, that is, that's a stupid thing to say. I know there's some really smart people that say that, but just think about it for a second. Is that statement true? It cannot be true. 
Because if it were true, then absolute truth would exist. It contradicts itself, right? It's a stupid thing. But that's what they've been taught through the media. All right, it's preaching time. We expect the Sunday school teachers to take 40 minutes to teach our kids what God told us to teach them. A Sunday school teacher, teacher cannot undo in 40 minutes what the world has taught your child for six days. Amen. All right? Look, my wife is, is reading a, a, a lady's study designed to reach preteen girls because we got a preteen girl. She's probably the sweetest person in the family besides my wife, you know. So <clears throat> my wife is gathering weekly with some other moms of preteen girls and discussing these lies that young girls believe. Now, I used a group of 30 for what I talked about from one county. Th these statistics I'm going to give you are from about 1,500 girls across the United States. Okay, some of them were homeschooled, some of them were Christian schooled, some of them were public schooled. 80% believe the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Koran are the same. 68% believe that one must earn his salvation. 56% believe that this is... I don't even like to utter these words, Brother Chris. 56% believe that Jesus may have sinned while he were on the earth. 36% believe the Bible to be accurate. 32% actually believe that Jesus rose from the grave. We act as though this is something that's crept in, but it's been slowly coming in over the last few generations, and I think it's because Christians in general, the local churches in particular, have not been faithful to carry out the both of the Great Commission. Uh, uh, of my father's generation, which would have been those born after what Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation, those people were born you know, around 1920. My father was born in the late 30s. So that generation, often called the traditional or the silent generation, 6% considered themselves atheists. Baby boomers, which is my mother's generation, uh, she's a little younger than my father, 5% uh, considered themselves atheists. My generation, it went back up to six, millennials seven, but with these Gen Zs, that's kids born after 1999, it's, it's almost doubled to 13%. Biola, which is a Bible institute in Los Angeles, recently did a survey of what they deem to be the cream of the crop local uh, youth groups across the country. Okay, so these, all these kids profess to be Christian, profess to be part of a youth group that's considered a good youth group. 70% have persistent and measurable doubts about what God's Word says about Jesus. 70%. I tell you, it's because we're not following the both of the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? Can somebody quote the Great Commission? I know the missionary can. Somebody quote the Great Commission besides Brother Chris. It's given five times. We read it once. Somebody quote it. All right, that's Mark 16, 15. Brother Chris, can you give me the long one, Matthew 28? Okay, Matthew 28, if you start with 18, it says all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, everything else he said, perfectly correct. Luke says that repentance and remission of sins, it behooved him to suffer for our sins. And repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name beginning at Jerusalem. John said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Well, I'm not looking at anybody in front of me that was born of a virgin, right? I'm not looking at any of you that God called to die on the cross, we hope. All right? So I think, you know, when I look at sin and sinners, and I know y'all do it too, we get mad. And we, we often sit inside the four walls of our church and we complain about how these millennials have just gone to hell in a handbasket and these Generation Z, they're, just, they, they're even worse than the millennials. And, and we complain about them all the time. But when Jesus saw those people, he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever raised sheep in here beside me, but sheep are the dumbest animals on the face of the earth. They can be dying with worms and you have the worm medicine and you have to fight that sheep to give it to it. All right? They could be dying of starvation and you have sweet feed in your hand and they won't eat it if they're not accustomed to your presence. 
And that's really the way a lot of these lost teenagers look at us today. All right? Yeah. We're talking about carrying out the, the both, okay? Acts 1 8 says, Ye shall be witnesses after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, I'm not one of these guys that thinks the Holy Ghost came in, in chapter 2, okay? Because Jesus said over here in John, the Bible says he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. If Jesus gave them the Holy Ghost, they had it. So what happened in Acts 2 is they didn't get more of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost got more of them. They spent 10 days praying and fasting, and the, the proof that they were filled with the Holy Ghost was not that they were preaching in other tongues, though me and Chris can do that today if you want us to. He can preach in Spanish, and I can preach in French or, or Icelandic. Well, the proof was that the entire congregation was out there witnessing. That was the proof. So the Great Commission is in His power, authority, with His power, that spirit filling, with His passion, loving those people that we can't understand how they would be involved in these things. We are to preach repentance and remission of sins in His name to every person of every people in every place. Both in our Jerusalem. You're Nellie Berg. Tomb something or other. Uh, Tomb Suba, Tomb Suba, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chunky, yeah. Wahalak. I, I, I know some of the town names right here. Scuba, <laughs> Shukalak. That does not look like it says Shukalak, right? It, it looks like it says Shukalak, but it's Shukalak. <laughs> All right, that's your Jerusalem and, and your Judea. Samaria is wherever the people are around here that you hate. And the uttermost part, that's where me and him are going. Both. Look, we're not doing the best job with the Great Commission. Because if you talk to any mission agency that I know of, you'll find that the numbers of missionaries is dwindling. And missionary, older missionaries, you've been talking about Brother Kennard and Brother Popwell and Brother Sisk and some of these names, they'll get to weeping if you ask them about it. Because the number of missionaries are shrinking. So we're not doing a good job there, but we're doing a terrible job here because we're not even reaching our children. That's right. Hmm. We use our eschatology to say that God won't do a work, but the sinners haven't changed. The Savior hasn't changed. It's we, Andy, that have changed. Did you know God chose Abraham and Genesis 18, 19 says God chose Abraham because he would command his children after him. And, and me and, and uh, Vincent's wife there, I have forgotten her name, were talking a while ago about the fact that everybody wants somebody else to parent their children. They just want to be their children's friend. My boys are my friends. But my oldest, I made him take Spanish in high school. The teacher asked him, and he'll tell you I'm his friend. But the teacher asked him, who ran things at your house? He said, my daddy. That's the only reason I'm in this class. <laughs> Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15, choose you this day whom you will serve. But he didn't tell his kids that. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Look, in Joshua chapter 4, that God has just done a miracle, right? Y'all all know the crossing of the Red Sea. How about the crossing of the Jordan? God opened up the Red Sea and said, walk on dry ground. When he came to the Jordan, God told them, step out and I'll dry it up. When they stepped out, the water was under their feet. And then the Bible says the water stood up and they went in on dry ground. The, the priest stood there and held the Ark of the Covenant, the the, the physical picture of God's presence amongst the people. And two million people walked through on dry grounds. And then, while they're still standing there, Joshua tells the uh, one man from every tribe, go in there and get a stone out of the middle of that river and we're going to build an altar right here. And when your children ask you what meaneth these stones, you tell them what God did. And I tell you, that's the both that we're failing to do as a country. We are failing to teach our children God in American history. Okay? I want to encourage you. I got Look here. Deuteronomy chapter 6. If we were to turn over there, basically, I'm going to give you Hallman's paraphrase rather than turn over there because he told you you're going to be out by 2.30 and I'm thinking 2.45. Amen? Uh, <coughs> the, uh, he said, basically, Hallman's paraphrase, what I've commanded you, 
You teach it diligently to your children when you're sitting down, when you're getting up, when you're walking by the way, wherever you're at. Pin it to your hand. Pin it to your head. Pin it to your doorpost. In other words, you teach them with the words what great things God had done, what great things God expects. And then you show them that even when you're working or at the house, even when you're thinking, because a lot of us be sitting dwelling on stuff we don't need to be dwelling on. That's why, did y'all know statistics say divorce within the church is higher than divorce outside the church? Now, I think that's probably because a lot of people outside the church don't get married. But the fact remains that it's 17% more likely for you to get a divorce than your buddy out yonder. It's because our thinking life is not right. Every available opportunity, we've got to show them and teach them, word and deed, what God expects. 1 John 1 20 says, God knows all things. So what we face out here is not a surprise to the Lord. And as I told you this morning, God's done miracles in this country throughout its existence. And he can do it again if we want him to. Now, if you believe he won't do it again, you're right. Because he's not going to force it on you. He didn't make you get saved. He's not going to make you get revived. You've got to choose it. You've got to ask him. But I want to talk to you about God and American history. We, we talk about the American Revolution. I'm going to say something, Brother Warren. It's kind of unusual, but we really didn't have a revolution. Now, I know y'all are saying I've lost my mind right now, but a revolution typically, the French had a revolution. Do y'all, y'all know enough history to know what happened with the French? They just started overthrowing the government, chopping people's heads off, murdering them, assassinating them. They tore down the churches. You you talk to a Frenchman and he'll tell you that in the late 1700s, they threw off God and king. Well, none of it. That's a revolution. Some godly men put together a government before we wrote the Declaration of Independence. A good at least a year before we had the Declaration of Independence, we had a government in place. So our country was born more out of a revival than it was a revolution. And if you look at history, I may do a bad job of it today, but if you look at history, you'll see that every major victory we've had was preceded by a revival of one sort or another. Listen, I want to start... Uh, 200 years before our Declaration of Independence in 1588. The Spanish Armada. Thanks to what Columbus had started in 1492, the Spanish ruled the ocean blue. England going against the Spanish Armada was a foregone conclusion of defeat. It wasn't going to happen. England was not going to beat the Spanish Armada. I believe it was King Philip, but whoever the king in Spain was was coming back over there because Henry VIII started the church for the wrong reasons. Yes, indeed. But Henry VIII started the church and separated from the Catholic Church and Spain was coming to make, uh, forcefully make them Catholics. Now, Henry might have started it for the wrong reason, but those churches believed at that point in 1588 in only by grace, only through the word, only by faith, They believed pretty close to right. Queen Elizabeth said, or Queen whatever, I think it was Elizabeth, said, I have to lay down my life for my God. We shall shortly have a famous victory over the enemies of my God and many other things. But basically, if the... Sometimes I try to say it in Spanish, but since we have Spanish experts here, I won't try to say it in Spanish. (laughs) If the Spanish had won, you'd be Spanish-speaking Catholics right now. I tell you, that's his story in our history, and we need to tell our children about this. I could throw in some Baptist history right here. There are people today who want to tell you that, that Baptists came out of the Protestant Reformation, and that couldn't be further from the truth. In the 1500s, a cardinal, now I'm not Catholic, I've never been Catholic, but I know a little bit about Catholicism, and the cardinal's boss is the Pope. So he's a higher up. He's not just Joe Blow Catholic, he is a leader. He said if being willing to die for your faith was proof of who had the apostles' doctrine. Anybody know when the Catholic Church officially started? 300. He said in the early 1500s, if proof of being willing, if 
being willing to die for your faith was proof of who had the apostles' doctrine. It could be none other than the Anabaptists because they had died more numerously and more joyfully than all the other martyrs put together in these last 1,200 years. So since the Catholic Church has been taking record, we didn't come out. I think if you study Zwingli, Calvin, and so forth, they took what they deemed to be the best parts of Bible doctrine and married it with what they thought the best parts of Catholic doctrine was. And they came up with what we know as Lutherans, Presbyterians, etc. But that's a rabbit trail. It didn't cost you nothing. <laughs> His story in our history. In 1608, there was a group from Scrooby, England, that left and went to Holland because they had this Reformation in England, right? But they reformed. They separated from the Catholic Church, but you still could only worship the way they saw fit. And these people in Scrooby, they didn't see fit to worship the same way that the king and queen and so forth worship. So they left the country for religious freedom. But then they realized, like I hope you're realizing right now, they're losing their kids to society. So they came back and convinced some businessmen to send them to the new world. Hmm. They had a long, arduous journey, journey. A few people died on that trip over the sea to come. Northern parts of Virginia is what their charter said, about 300 miles north of Virginia, amen. But <clears throat> here's, the, here's what I want you to see. Listen to this. They had a long, arduous journey. They get there, it's, it's almost winter, and they need to get housing built. But before, Brother, Brother Bill, before they get off of that ship, they wrote, in the name of God, amen, we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread king, Lord King James, and by the grace of God <coughs> of Great Britain, he's the king of all these other places by the grace of God, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to the new colony. Listen, listen to that. For the advancement of the Christian faith. That's why they came. Hmm. These people were committed to Christ before all things. That's his story in our history. Okay? Did you know that by the sovereign grace of God, they landed at a place where there were no natives? Grace got them through that first winter when nearly half of them died. Grace brought them a Native American who spoke a little English who brought them another Native American named Squanto. Y'all probably know him thanks to Walt Disney, but Walt Disney's story is not exactly right. Squanto not only understood the Native American culture, but he understood English and the English crazy pilgrims that had come over, and he helped them. And thanks to, their, thanks to God's grace and a godly relationship with Squanto, they had a peace treaty with Massasoit that lasted 100 years. That's his story in our history. What you may not know about Jamestown, it was settled in 1608, right? That was a business purpose, and that's what the world would teach us. That it was just for business purposes. Y'all probably know about Pocahontas from Walt Disney too, but did you know that Pocahontas uh, professed faith in Jesus Christ and was baptized? These people didn't compartmentalize their walk with Christ from their worldly endeavors. It was one and the same to them. This is God in American history. Listen, church membership was required in all but two colonies. But lest you think that those two colonies were worldly, let me tell you about those two colonies. One of them was uh, called the Little Baptist Colony, Rhode Island. It was later called the Little Baptist State. Now, Rhode Island, they, they practiced uh, the Great Commission. They were on the advance for the Great Commission. So much so, an older man went back up in. Roger Williams was kind of run out of of Massachusetts for preaching something besides this Protestant doctrine. You know, the pilgrims believed that they, that they had the right to worship as they saw fit, and you had the right to worship as they saw fit. And if you didn't worship like they saw fit, they whipped you, jailed you, etc. So Roger Williams left and got his own charter and started Rhode Island. And <clears throat> Obadiah Holmes was an older man who went back up into Massachusetts preaching, and he was whipped soundly. For preaching the gospel. He would not allow somebody to pay his fine. Reckon why he wouldn't let him pay his fine, Miss Hire. He said, you're on the right track anyway. He said, they didn't call me to preach. And if we pay their fine, that's like saying they have the authority to tell me not to preach. God Almighty called me to preach. They can't stop me from preaching. But how many of us today let, let society tell us when and where we can preach? Hmm, come on now, God in American history. He had a revival before. We need a revival again. Yeah, 
the Quakers were very nonviolent. That's Pennsylvania's the Quaker state, right? Uh, they were very nonviolent, and you'll find in the colonial days they had a worship house for in Philadelphia for every Christian denomination. They had a synagogue and even one small mosque. They believed in preaching the gospel, but they left the response up to man and the Lord, whereas some of these other Protestant colonies would force you to follow Christ. Look, men are born to sin, right? All these colonies started, some Georgia even, I don't have time to get into it, but Georgia was, was started as a Christian endeavor as well. But men are born into sin, right? The Bible calls us in Ephesians chapter 2 the children of wrath and the children of disobedience. So we're born to sin and we choose to sin. So what happened? Things regressed. Years later, a man named Stoddard, seeing church membership fall off up north, came up with what he called the halfway covenant. So Vincent could join the church because Brother Bill and Miss Betty are in the church. He don't have to be saved. That's basically what the halfway covenant was. So then when a fellow named Jonathan Edwards comes along, he realizes the church is full of lost people. I think if you look at what the Bible describes as Christians and look around at most churches today, there's a lot of them today that's full of lost people. Hmm. By the time Edwards came to position, he could clearly see how bad the situation was. Edwards was a non-emotional person. Edwards read his sermon like this, but he preached new life, what we would call the new birth. When he preached his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, history tells us, Brother Andy, that people were holding on to the pews because they were worried about falling off into hell. God sent another man by the name of George Whitfield. He's considered a forgotten founding father. He's the first thing that had people in Georgia wanting to know what was going on in Massachusetts and vice versa. But unlike, unlike uh, Edwards, he was a very dramatic man, a very charismatic nature. Um, but God used him greatly, mightily. Benjamin Franklin is one of the least religious of our founding fathers. He said that when Whitfield was preaching, it seemed like the whole world had gone to church. Because everybody was there. I have read where people rode horses two days just to get there and hear him preach. Vincent, they say you could hear him for a mile on flat ground preaching. He finished one sermon and a fellow said, hey, can I put that in the paper? He said, yeah, if you could put that thundercloud and that rainbow in the paper. Because he, he was preaching outside and he used the weather as part of his sermon to describe the wrath of God and the grace of God. Uh, Benjamin Franklin put his, he, he was like the Bill Gates of his day. He owned a part of every newspaper and he put this man's sermon in every newspaper in there. And so he's the first one to call this the, the, the American nation. Uh, boy, I could tell you so much more as to why he's called a forgotten founding father, but we think all oh, them's Protestants and Methodists. I think if you'll study your history, the conservative Baptist came out of Jonathan Edwards preaching. And Whitfield wrote, you know what his biggest grief about preaching over here was, Brother Bill? He said, all my chickens have turned to ducks. <laughs> Shubal Stern started the first Baptist church in the South. That sounds like a good Southern name, right? Shubal Stearns, he's from Connecticut. <laughs> He got saved under Whitfield's preaching, was baptized in a Baptist church. A, a group of Baptists in, in a group of Baptist churches in Philadelphia sent him to Virginia. He was tarred and feathered in Virginia and run out of the state. So he went to North Carolina and started a church. Daniel Boone took the first Baptist from there to Buffalo Ridge, Tennessee, uh, Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church in Gray, Tennessee. Friend of mine, uh, Jody Jenkins, is pastor in that church. It still exists today. Amen. Boone took the first ones on up into to. Uh, uh, Kentucky, uh, a man out of that, that work there in North Carolina named Curtis is the first Baptist church, first Baptist preacher in this state. Amen. It's God in American history. They didn't think it could get any worse when Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield started preaching, but God sent a revival, and out of that revival came a country. Amen. Hmm. That revival lasted 30 or 40 years. During that time, we had the French and Indian War. Should we have won the French and Indian War? No. The, the English were trying to fight the French and the Indians the way they would fight in Europe. 
Indians did they hid behind trees. They didn't well, march out across a field some kind of insanity like they did back then. And they were slaughtered. Braddock, the general, was killed, and they ran, they ran wagons back and forth off of his grave so that people, the Indians couldn't find it and, and you know dismember his body and such as crazy stuff they might do. George Washington had two horses shot from underneath him and had had bullet holes in his jacket. But he survived. God gave the victory. I think it's because of that revival that was going on. You talk about the midnight ride of Paul Revere. What happened? Right? We, all, we, we know because of a poem written in 1860, we think we know that he just went riding up the coastline hollering, the British are coming, the British are coming. Come on, know your history. One third of Americans were loyalists. One third were riding the fence. And whoever won, they were going to be on their side. And one third were patriots. He didn't just ride indiscriminately up the road hollering the British are coming. He went directly to a preacher's house named Clark. In that house was Samuel Adams and John Hancock. And he went there to tell Samuel Adams and John Hancock, you got to go or you're going to be captured by the British tomorrow. Samuel Adams and John Hancock turned to the pastor and said, will your people fight? The pastor said, I have trained them for this hour. And the next day, the shot heard around the world was fired. I tell you again, our country was born out of a revival, not out of the revolution. Hmm. People often say today that all of our founding fathers were deists. That might be true of Franklin if he was even that committed. Uh, certainly true of Jefferson. But did you know what they don't tell us today is nearly every member of the First and Second Continental Congress and the Constitutional Convention were active and prominent members of their local churches. Hmm? These men had preachers come in and preach to them. John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail about a particular sermon from Psalms and told her she needed to share it with her daddy, who was a preacher. Hmm. Benjamin Franklin, we say he's the least religious, right? Here's a quote from him when he was governor of Pennsylvania. I do believe in one God, the creator and governor of the universe, the rewarder of the good, the punisher of the wicked. And I acknowledge the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. But his best quote is from the Constitutional Convention. Remember, this is the least religious founding father. The least religious founding father. I'm going to say that one more time. The least religious founding father, he said during the Constitutional Convention, they, they've been fighting for five weeks and hadn't gotten anywhere. He said, I've lived long, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. Amen. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid and then he asked for a day of prayer and fasting and asked that they start every meeting with prayer. This is the least religious of the founding fathers. And he's more religious than the average independent Baptist I know today. Back up for a moment. Should the 13 colonies win that war? Logically, no. Did you know Washington described himself as a sinner saved by grace? Did you know during the Revolutionary War, Washington became convinced that his baptism was unscriptural and he got a Baptist named John Gano to baptize him? Did you know that our troops nearly starved to death, that you could see where they walked by the blood they left in the snow? Did you know that Washington refused any pay to serve? The, the, the honor of being asked to serve was, was pay enough, he said, remuneration enough, he said. Uh, did you know that uh, he slept in the cold with his men because of some squabbling of some bureaucrats that didn't like Washington? They weren't getting paid and they weren't getting fed and he didn't have proper housing. So he refused to have his own proper housing because he's down there loving his neighbor like he loves himself. Hmm. Did you know that Washington attacked a group of mercenaries on Christmas Day to motivate a hungry, penniless uh, group of soldiers to keep fighting? Huh? It's God. My, my favorite picture of the American Revolution is not Bunker's Hill or any of those battles. It's the man that came to be the president on his knees in the snow praying for God yes, to work. Yes, that's right. yes. hmm. God gave the victory. After the Constitutional Convention finally agreed on the Constitution, it needed to be ratified. Patrick Henry, he's often called the trumpet, right? Give me liberty or give me death. Of the, he's called the trumpet because of that speech there in the House of Burgesses. 
he went to a Baptist pastor named Elder John Leland and said, I need your help to get this passed. John Leland said, I, I got a problem with it. I don't see anything about freedom of assembly. I don't see anything about freedom of speech. I don't see anything about uh, you having to tell me why you arrest me. I don't see anything that says I can uh, defend myself. Amen. He said, I'll get you a bill of rights if you get this passed. So by that time, Baptists were a voting powerhouse in Virginia, and he helped get that passed. Uh, another rabbit trail I won't charge you for. Y'all hear all this separation of church and state. Do you know where that came from? That came from a letter written to a group of Baptists who were worried that what they're doing with the First Amendment today and saying you can't talk at public school about Christ and you can't talk at the courthouse about Christ and you can't talk in Washington about Christ. They were worried that that's what they were going to do. And what they're doing with that is turning it upside down from what... Uh, Jefferson originally said, you don't have to worry about that because there's a high wall of separation. He was saying there's a high wall of separation so the church could do what she thought was necessary. Hmm. Hmm. i got to hurry along. I'm, I'm, I'm running long. I know I am. <sighs> do you know Yale and Harvard were started as preacher's colleges? I talked about that in Sunday school just a little bit. Yale's original motto uh, had an open Bible uh, with some Hebrew script on it. And underneath it in Latin, it said lux and veritas, which is light and truth. Harvard's original, their motto today is veritas or truth. But their original motto was truth for Christ and his church. Okay. 1799, Timothy Dwight IV is the president of Yale and he realized that the majority of this mainly preacher's college no longer believed this book. And he didn't do like we do and just sit inside the, the church house and complain about them. No, he went out there and engaged them. He debated them. He preached a series of sermons on the veracity of God's word. And a revival broke out that lasted 20 or 30 years, which gave us the victory over the Muslims in North Africa. You know, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, the Marine Corps sings about. Those Marines, he, Jefferson sent over there to defeat the Muslims. All right? And the War of 1812, those two victories came from that revival that lasts called the Second Great Awakening. All right? 1855, D.L. Moody was saved. 1857, uh, the Dutch church... The old Dutch church in New York City was falling on hard times. It's like Brother Fry and I were talking about one church. I forgot which one it is now, but it was mostly made up of older people. Excuse me, as you travel around here, you'll see that a lot of churches are mostly made up of older people. This church was like that, and they saw it dwindling. So they hired Jeremiah Lanfear to come in and knock on doors and tell people about Christ and see if they couldn't see the church grow. After some weeks with no success, he decided he needed to start a prayer meeting. The first prayer meeting, only a couple of people showed up. But within weeks, 10,000 businessmen in New York City were taking their hour lunch to pray for the country. Amen. Now, personally, I think that's why the North won the war. The end of slavery was inevitable. It was inevitable. And we want to give Lincoln credit with this Emancipation Proclamation. Honestly, if you read the Emancipation Proclamation, it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. He only freed the slaves in the parts of the South that they hadn't won. So he only freed them in the parts he didn't have any control over. Okay, it's just propaganda. Slavery wasn't... Robert E. Lee had already freed all of his slaves. The end of slavery was inevitable. But, you know... War historian said, okay, I wanted to name a kid Thomas, and she wouldn't let me. She said Thomas was a doubter. I said, you didn't ever read anything about Thomas Jackson, amen. <laughs> Thomas Jackson said somebody asked him how he was so, so steadfast with bullets whizzing all around him. He said, well, very simply, I'm a Christian. Amen. <laughs> I'm as safe here as if I were home in bed. Because I'm going to live till God's ready for me to die. And then I'm going to die. Stonewall Jackson uh, was killed by friendly fire uh, in, in approximately the middle of the war. And historians believe if he had not been killed, the South would have won. But did you know, Brother Mangum, he was against the Civil War from its outset? 
Do you know why he was against the Civil War? All during the Civil War, Brother Bill, he sent money home to a preacher that was evangelizing slaves. And he was against the Civil War because he said it would do great damage to the cause of Christ at home and abroad for the country to split. I think he must have been right because God saw fit for the North to win and the country to be reunited. Hmm. You know, that, that, that revival there started with Jeremiah Lanfear. It carried on through men like D.L. Moody and, and, and a fellow named Robert Sheffy. They preached, uh, D.L. Moody preached in northern camps. Sheffy preached in the southern camps. It carried on after the war. Uh, a man named uh, Billy Sunday was saved in 1886 and carried that revival on through the early 1900s. Should we have had such a powerful part of World War I? Probably not, but I believe God honored that revival that was going on. God honored his people. Look, the, the 20s, people didn't think it could get any worse. It was, the 20s were very similar to what we see out here today. The Depression and the World War II brought their own revival. But let's look for a second. I'm coming in for a landing, I promise. Let's look for a second. We tied Korea. It's the best you can say. We lost Vietnam. Yeah. That's the best you can say. Why? I think we needed a revival. Mm -hmm. Now, some, Brother Vincent, will tell us that there was a revival amongst the independent Baptists and, and some Southern Baptists and some, some Lutheran, Missouri Synod, whatever that means, <clears throat> in the 70s and early 80s because of that. And if you think back with the moral majority and Reagan getting elected. It, it's, it's possible. But if we look around, what do we know? It wasn't as far-reaching as, as the previous revivals, and it's done. We need one right now. Amen. We talked about 2 Chronicles 16.9 a couple of three different times today. God's eyes are still looking to prove himself strong on behalf of of him whose heart is perfect towards him. Of him whose heart is perfect towards him. Of him whose heart is perfect towards him. It, the revival not coming, it's not God. It's not the sinners. It's us. Amen. We're not carrying out the both of the Great Commission. We don't even know our own history, most of us. Sadly, a lot of us don't even know the scriptures, let alone the history yeah. that, that where the scriptures are brought forth in history and where we see God working in history that prove the scriptures to be true. 243, I'm coming in for a landing. 243, I don't mean the time 243 now. I mean 2 Chronicles 714. 243 is a good rifle. It's light. You use it in shooting competitions. You can shoot long range with it. Two, if my people, Miss Evelyn, what you're called by my name, two, four, shall humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, and pray. Four, three, I'll hear from heaven. Forgive their sin and heal their land. I don't know about you, brother, but I want a revival. I believe our country's right for rapture, revolution, or revival. And I'm praying God will prepare us for the rapture and protect us from a revolution by providing us a revival. I'm ready right now, as soon as God gives me the funds, to go to Germany and start a church for the U.S. military. Brother Chris has already started the church. Praise God. I've already started some, three in West Africa and one in Iceland. We're ready to go do it again. The question is, are you willing to go to Tumsuba? Are you willing to go to Wahala? Are you willing to go down whatever street you live on? Are you willing to go to your employer? Are you willing to go to your friends at work, to your friends at school? Amen. What are you going to do? Both. Brother Chris and I are doing our best to carry out the Great Commission to the uttermost, but are you going to do your part to carry out the Great Commission to the where my feet are? Amen. I'm going to shut up now. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much.